Welcome to Mom in Mind, a podcast about maternal mental health from conception, pregnancy, to birth and postpartum. Real stories from moms and family members who've made it from struggling to wellness, and interviews with experts and advocates who work for moms and families to get the help they need. We discuss very real struggles that can sometimes be hard to hear, but these are stories that need to be told so that moms and families can know that healing is possible. This podcast is meant to offer information and awareness and is not a replacement for treatment by a professional or professional training. Thank you for being with us today. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Mom in Mind. I'm your host, Dr. Kat. In this episode, we are going to be getting into a really needed topic for us to be discussing, which is sex during the pregnancy and postpartum period. There's a lot of questions that people have about this. What's normal? What's not normal? What happens with our desire after you have a baby? What happens to the relationship? And Elise Springer is going to be sharing with us a lot of great perspective and a lot of great information on what happens and some things for us to think about and maybe some things for us to think about a little differently. I really love the perspective she brings and the directness that she brings also in speaking about a topic. You know, most of us get a little bit awkward when talking about sex and Elise just states it as fact. Some of the things that she discusses is really just calling things what it is. And she has a really direct approach that I just love and is refreshing so that we can just get it out there and have a discussion. Elise is a licensed marriage and family therapist practicing psychotherapy in Los Angeles. She uses a combination of CBT, EMDR, and psychodynamic modalities in helping people with all kinds of things like depression, anxiety, death and loss, relationship conflict, HIV AIDS, perinatal mood and anxiety disorders, substance use, and people who are having difficulty with the creative process for artists and writers. She's taught and lectured in a variety of settings on all of those topics in a lot of really important places. And most importantly for us today, she's able to talk about sex and sexuality related to perinatal mental health and the change into parenthood. In addition to her current work and her private practice, she is a training faculty and governing council member of Maternal Mental Health Now, board member of 2020 Mom Project, and a past co-chair of the Los Angeles County HIV Mental Health Task Force. I'm really looking forward to this conversation with Elise, so let's welcome her. Hi, Elise. Welcome. Thanks so much for being with us. Hi, Kat. How's it going? Great. And I am excited and happy for our audience to hear this episode and to talk to you about sex and postpartum sex specifically. What happens? What Um, happens? Isn't that the great mystery? (laughs) Yes. What happens? We all know about sex because most of our clients and probably listeners, right, if they've had a baby, have had sex. There's a pretty strong correlation between those two. Yeah. So I want to dig into this with you and answer a lot of the questions that a lot of people have about what's normal and what happens and, you know, all of the things that impact sex life after baby And before we get into that, give us a refresher on the work that you're doing. Sure. Well, first of all, let me just say, for those of you who are a little bit concerned about words and sensitivity to language, I will be using some very graphic language. When I talk about sex, I tend to be very direct. I think that a lot of times we are very fearful about using words when it comes to sex and we use sort of like very vague and polite terms and Don't get me wrong, I like to be polite, but I think sometimes when we are talking about sex, it's necessary to just kind of put that aside and have real conversations, whether it's with each other or with our clients, if you're a therapist. And generally, one of the ways that I kind of like to say that to my clients, so I will say that to you and my audience, is I am very graphic, and if it starts to be uncomfortable, please let me know. And so to your audience, I would say if it starts to be too graphic, feel free to stop listening and just know that the intention is not to be rude or offend, but just to have a very frank conversation about sex. All right. Great. Thank you for that. You're welcome. So that being said, I actually love talking about sex. It's one of my favorite topics. And I think that I sort of just gained my interest in that working. I worked with domestic violence and on campus domestic violence when I was in college. And I started to kind of get familiar with that world. So then when I went to grad school, you know, my sex education therapy class was one of my favorite classes. And it kind of led me to my 
sort of graduate degree work in HIV and AIDS. And that is where I got most of my training around sex therapy and how to talk about sex because it's just naturally a part of that community. And I really noticed when I began working in the prenatal and postpartum world that everyone would kind of want to talk about it and they would sort of drop these very vague hints around sex, Mm -hmm. whether it was sort of asking questions during pregnancy about, you know, not being able to orgasm or like just, and even in postpartum, like, well, what's normal? What's normal sex? So it just became really clear to me that I think that this was a topic that a lot of people don't discuss because so much of it is about recovery and healing postpartum Mm -hmm. and breastfeeding and babies that I think the dynamic between the couple um, focuses on chores and relationship, but less on sex and sexuality. So I just sort of began trying to bring that a little bit more into, of course, when clients bring it in, just being more direct about it and talking about it more frankly. Mm -hmm. Right. Absolutely. And thank you for that. And also, I think it would be great to kind of start off with like what you hear most commonly when people are bringing it up or what you see most commonly when they're not bringing it up in terms of like just what's common in terms of sex and desire postpartum. Yeah. You know, what I find so funny is that a lot of times When we're dealing with postpartum mood disorders, that tends to be the focus, but the conversation does not very often in the beginning talk about a woman's own sex or sexuality. It's mostly about how partner wants sex and they don't. And I think that we use this in such the like common pop vernacular, like we joke around about being touched out, you know, I think amongst therapists and when moms get together with their discussion, there's a lot of talk about being touched out and I don't want my husband to touch me. And, you know, I don't want my partner to touch me. I just had a baby. They can take care of themselves. Right. I mean, I have had numerous women come in and say, thank God for porn and numerous men come in and say, thank God for porn. Mm. And I get that, but I also find it a little bit sad because we know that one of the biggest predictors of happiness in a relationship is intimacy. And that is often, you know, can be sex and sexuality. Let me just say for a second what I mean in the difference between sex and sexuality. When I talk about right. sex, it's about, you know, kind of genital sex. It is, are we masturbating? Are we having intercourse? Are we having oral sex? And when I talk about sexuality, it's different because I think women in general before a baby have one kind of sexuality and after a baby have a different kind of sexuality. And I like to think about that in relation to kind of young adult sexuality, even if you're a mom having a baby at 40, and adult sexuality, which is like what it is like to be sexual as a mom. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes those two words don't go together, right? Right. Both in pop culture and for ourselves, it's like we just think about moms and sex and it's sort of like the common like gross, right? I always think about what was that lonely, is it Lonely Island? Who's Andy Samberg does that sort of joking about like some SNL skit about having sex with like MILFs basically. And even that term is sort Mm -hmm. of like derogatory in some Mm -hmm. way, but there's just this sort of pushback that I see a lot of times in that first year postpartum about taking on sexuality in a different kind of way. Mm -hmm. So a couple different things happen. Generally, it starts off being like, well, what is normal for sex postpartum? And then we kind of start to shift the discussion about, well, what's normal for you Mm -hmm. and your adult woman sexuality rather than your sort of more young sexuality? Mm -hmm. Right. I'm wondering about that in terms of kind of this transition to motherhood, what all goes into the idea of what a woman's sexuality is in her transition. So like, for instance, is has she been made to think that, like you were saying before, that mom's don't have sex or that it's normal to like after you have a baby to not want to have sex ever again or whatever. Who knows what's going into that idea? Yeah, I mean, and statistically, like we know that there are some statistics that show, you know, what is considered a sexless marriage, right? A sexless marriage is a marriage that has sex 10 times per year or less. So, you know, when we think about that, I always like to say to somebody, well, what's your idea of like a robust sex life? Like if you were having sex 
regularly, what would that look like? And I think on average, you know, most women might say pre-baby once to twice to three times a week, just depending on their level of sexuality. But it drops so tremendously after having a baby. And obviously, there's a lot of reasons for that. We know that there's sort of this certain risk factors that influence sex. I mean, the first being, what was your pre-pregnancy level functioning of sex and sexuality. Mm -hmm. If you didn't feel very sexual before pregnancy, well, the likelihood after having a baby is that that's not going to change. If you guys, and you know, I mean, we know that lust really only lasts for about two years, which is so interesting, right? Because we often, two years or more is often the length of time that people sort of commonly think is a good amount of time before you get married. You know, we're getting married right around the time that lust drops off. And then it's like, how long are you waiting to have baby, depending Mm -hmm. on career and finances and planning? Mm. So, you know, what was your pre-level functioning? What was your pre-level of sex? If you were having sex once every six months before baby, and then you're having it not at all after baby, I mean, that's not such a huge change. Mm -hmm. If you and your partner were having sex two to three times a week before baby, and then after baby, it's once every month or every two months, I mean, that's a pretty significant difference. Mm -hmm. You know, there's other risk factors. We know fatigue. You know, sleeplessness is a huge reason for lack of sexual desire. Mm -hmm. I find so interesting because I was going to assume that traumatic birth, like having a traumatic birth experience would impact having sex. And it actually doesn't as much as we think Mm -hmm. unless there's a third or fourth degree tear. Mm -hmm. And then that's the point at which, you know, traumatic birth really impacts women much more. Right. There was actually a study this year that debunked that C-sections you know, don't have as much impact. I think for a long time, there was this sort of fashionable notion like, oh, well, if I have a C-section, nothing will change down below. My vagina will be the same. Women have this sometimes irrational fear of being sort of stretched and not realizing like our bodies are meant to go back to normal Mm. pre-birth size. But that is something that I hear so often. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, a couple of times I've had to say, well, you know, that's not going to impact your sex life. C-sections, don't necessarily mean that your sex life is not going to be impacted. They have the same rate of impact. That is interesting. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I think really speaking to, you know, I guess what research says and what we're finding is really important because there are already a lot of assumptions and maybe misperceptions, misperceptions, correct. Yeah. Yeah. About so many things, but specifically about sex and Mm -hmm. postpartum. You know, at one point, someone asked me to write an article about like, you know, five tips to better sex postpartum, right? And when I was saying, well, look, you know, we know that there's a specific pattern to resuming sex overall. I mean, of course, everybody's different, but this is the same in cisgendered partners and any same sex partners. There's a typical pattern. It starts with oral sex, then it moves to masturbation, then intercourse, and then oral sex on the woman. So if you have a cisgendered partnership, generally it starts with blowjobs, then it moves to masturbation for both partners, mutual masturbation, and then intercourse, and then, you know, finally oral sex. And what's so interesting is that it's like a quarter of women sort of by six weeks postpartum are engaging in oral sex on their partners. And it's about 12 weeks postpartum that that's the onset of intercourse. And I remember when I was writing this article, you know, the editor sent it back and was like, this can't be true. You know, like women are not having sex at 12 weeks postpartum. Nobody's giving blowjobs at six weeks postpartum. I'm like, well, that's actually not true. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we have this misperception that nobody's having sex after a new baby because so often when we see women who have postpartum mood disorders, you know, the depression, the anxiety, the PTSD, the OCD, whatever it is, is really interfering Mm -hmm. in that resumption of normal sexual activity. And we know so many women are not even necessarily aware that they're suffering from a postpartum mood disorder. Right. Right. That's absolutely true. I'm wondering too about the impact of, you know, there's the postpartum anxiety, they're dealing with something. But I hear so often in a lot of the women that are having difficulty 
with re-engaging in sex with their partners is that they feel the partners aren't supportive, but the partners are still asking to have sex. They want to have sex and the mom is telling me like, there's no way. Yeah. And so what about that? What do I see to be the most common in my practice anyways is that dynamic. What is that about? Well, I think that that's like a little bit of a feedback loop, right? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, we know that it's mom's perception of partner sexuality that influences their own desire. So if a mom thinks like, oh, partner really wants me all the time, there might be some interest. But if it's perceived as being too much, right? I think it was a, yeah, it was a Canadian study in 2016 found that if you know, a mom found her partner's desire to be too much that her own desire waned. So there's like this bizarre balance of like, what is just the right amount of desire to be reciprocated? Mm -hmm. But I think what you're talking about, Kat, is actually two things. And this is what happens is that it gets confounded. Mm -hmm. There's sex, and then there is the emotional intimacy that allows for sexual satisfaction and relationship. Mm -hmm. So when we think about sex, what a lot of people don't realize is, right, so that we know that there's four parts to sex, right? There's desire, there's arousal, there's orgasm, and then there's sort of like the come down period, right? Or the sort of relaxation period. And what women don't remember is that they often have desire after arousal. Mm -hmm. So part of it is that there's this pushback to want to respond to partner because there's this like, well, I don't feel like having sex, not remembering like, oh, wait a second. I kind of have to start to engage in sexual activity to then light up the desire. Mm -hmm. Right. So the women are often not feeling like having sex until they're in the process of having That's sex. That's right. That's mm -hmm. exactly right. So, mm -hmm. and then it's like kind of a reminder, like, oh, right. I actually like sex. <laughs> <laughs> or I like doing some part of sex, right? Depending on where they are in their own healing process. And mm -hmm. so that's one part of it. The other part you're talking about is relational satisfaction. I mean, these are all the things that the Gottman talk about where in that postpartum period, the four horsemen are so alive and well, that sort of criticism and stonewalling and defensiveness and all of that is really what's getting in the way. So I think I'm going to just speak to just cisgender couples right now. So if you're listening, I'm really just talking specifically about cisgendered couples. But, you know, men and women have different levels of desire and arousal. So men can walk in to desire much more quickly. Mm -hmm. And so they often take sex and intimacy, particularly men, right now generationally who are childbearing age. So if we're talking, I'm going to say 25 to kind of like 45, let's just give it that 20 year span. Mm -hmm. They are not necessarily taught to express emotion and feeling and comfort verbally. Right. They are taught that through touch right. or to express it physically. Right. And so women, on the other hand, we're talkers. We can mm -hmm. talk all day. We can feel connected <laughs> to our girlfriends. It's often how we bond. It's often how we reduce our cortisol levels, but it's not the same for men. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is that, you know, I think there's a misperception going on about what the intent is. Mm -hmm. So a mom comes in and is like, you know, my husband's just constantly badgering me. When are we going to have sex? And I'm telling him, no way, buddy, get out of here. Like the house is a mess. I've been breastfeeding this baby all day. Mm -hmm. What the F are you thinking? Mm -hmm. And what he's thinking is, I want to be close to you. I miss you. Mm -hmm. I need to feel connected to you. I am struggling with my own adjustment to parenthood. And I don't necessarily know how to verbalize that. Mm -hmm. And I need to connect and touch you. Mm -hmm. And what mom is thinking is like, get out of here. I've been touched all day mm -hmm. and forget it. So it's a loop that happens, right? So he yeah. puts out this bid for affection. She rejects it. And honestly, you know, the biggest reason why is because baby often fulfills women's sexual need. And I don't mean that with orgasm or genital, any of that. That's not what I'm saying. It's that connection. Mm -hmm. So having a baby for mom and breastfeeding baby and caring baby and all the touching that women do of babies necessarily in that first year mm -hmm. really fulfills their desire to be close and intimate. Mm -hmm. That's they so important. They need it 
in the, that the, in the way they might have before. That's so important that you're saying all this and also that you're specifically saying that it's not sexually based. I think for women specifically, maybe who have history of sexual abuse or having OCD, intrusive thoughts that are sexual in nature, that this, even if they haven't had sexual abuse themselves, like it's almost like the wires get crossed and having some like intimacy with partner plus like, oh my gosh, my boobs aren't used for that anymore. Now I have, I'm feeding this person. So like I've had multiple people say like, my breasts are not part of sex right now, not until I'm done with nursing. And that's a fine boundary to make. Absolutely. But I'm also wondering how you've seen people navigate that. Yeah, so I'm going to separate it out again. What I was saying about, you know, mom getting sexual needs met by baby again is I'm really talking about the emotional needs that mom has during sex and that sexual relationship, Mm -hmm. right? Because pre-baby women and men, you know, to feel desired, to feel connected, Mm -hmm. to feel vibrant. That's a lot of times the way women use sex, right? It's not necessarily as orgasm driven. You know, I think men sometimes also use it for that reason, right? They get their emotional needs met that way, but they're also a little bit more orgasm driven just because it happens so much easier for them, right? Mm -hmm. With women, it's so much more brain-based. It's just that connection that gets fulfilled. So that's one piece. Mm -hmm. For women who have a history of sexual trauma, this whole pregnancy birthing and postpartum period is fraught. This is where the PTSD might develop. It's just sort of the body changing. It's all of the exams. It is this sense of like the baby is constantly needing Mm -hmm. something which can feel really turns on all of that like red light. Oh my God, stop. Mm -hmm. Cortisol and endorphins in a mom. So then when dad approaches and says, you know, mom is already like kind of at that heightened state, even sometimes for women who have had sexual trauma, breastfeeding can be really awful. Mm -hmm. So then when, you know, a partner approaches and says, hey, can I touch you? Of course, the answer is immediately no. Right. But, you know, that has to be a dialogue. And I think this is where it can be tricky because so many women have not necessarily been honest with their partners about the kind of sexual victimization that they may have incurred. They may have been general, but I think it's, I find that that's been my experience is that oftentimes it might be like, oh, sure, you know, there was some victimization in my history, but it's not discussed between Mm -hmm. partners. Right. So then there's also no way to like contextualize what's happening specifically in the postpartum period when all like the role transition is happening and also just fatigue and all of the other things you described. Yeah, so then we've got a mom who has a history of sexual victimization. She's already feeling kind of triggered and lit up by all of the physical needs that baby has, how close baby is constantly not feeling like she's herself or in her home body. And then partner reaches out for connection because it so abruptly has just, you know, kind of disappeared because he needs to kind of feel like, hey, you know, I'm not just your roommate like we're in this together, we're in a partnership. Mm-hmm. But if there hasn't been this frank discussion, that bid for affection mm-hmm. gets perceived as a rejection. Mm-hmm. And then that rejection creates a withdrawal and then a lack of wanting to do something. And mm-hmm. then you get like lack of help around the house, which then is just going to cycle back to mom. Who's going to be like, you're never helping around the house. You're not doing anything. Yeah. So we've got anger met with anger, met with anger, met with anger. And we're off to the races and never, you know, anger, is like the biggest mood kill you could ever have for sex. <laughs> right, 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 absolutely. And all of that is not necessarily, um, just to differentiate, is not necessarily related to the sexual victimization. This is just a dynamic that happens this in happens, general too. That's right. This happens regardless of whether there was a history of victimization, that cycle of anger versus anger versus anger, right? I mean, I think that's a big part of it. And, you know, we know that for a long time. There's a lot of different information. And I think some of it is like so much in the perinatal mental health field, we have to say, we know some things, we don't know everything. Right. When we think about breastfeeding in particular, because I know you brought that up, you know, studies are mixed. Sometimes we think that prolactin reduces desire. And then that's the interplay between prolactin, which is what creates breast milk and testosterone and estrogen, that that interplay is what reduces desire. But other studies say that's not true. That's not true at all. It's only the socio-emotional component of breastfeeding, that it's the mom's emotional closeness that gets met by baby that then creates that sort of like, there's no other time for anything else. 
So the conclusion here is that we've got studies on both sides saying two things about breastfeeding. So I tend to kind of say, well, I don't know if breastfeeding is the cause because there's other ways of being intimate, but it is really easy to just say, yeah, don't touch my boobs. Like don't touch them. They are off limits. And it's also really easy to say, yeah, don't touch my vagina. Don't like, I'm not going down on you. It's all about empowering people to kind of say, well, what do you feel like doing? (laughs) I have literally asked this question and moms are like, I know you've just told me all these things, but (laughs) absolutely nothing. I feel like doing nothing. Uh And then I say, well, then we have to have a different kind of care plan. Mm -hmm. We have to have the kind of care plan where we're taking care of these other concerns. Mm -hmm. We have to make sure that you have enough sleep. Mm -hmm. We have to really look at the dynamic between you and your partner have your gender roles become so entrenched that there's no equality anymore? Mm-hmm. A lovely, lovely researcher who I'm going to plug because I think she's amazing and I don't feel like enough people know about her. And I actually feel like I should introduce the two of you so you can have her on. Please. Is this woman, Darby Saxby, who's at USC. Mm. And she is running something called the Family Nest. Oh gosh, what are the, it's like the neuroendocrinology of social ties. Wow. It's really cool. cool. Actually, she's doing an amazing study right now where she is tracking. They're doing MRIs of dad's brains during pregnancy and postpartum, which is kind of how I found her, of course, because, you know, I'm such a fan of supporting dads. And but she wrote a whole bunch of articles on a study that they found that really when partner participates in creating sort of an equal dynamic. Mm -hmm in the household sort of takes some of that mental load away Mm -hmm. that allows sex and sexuality or sex to flourish a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Where I think she called it marital happiness and satisfaction. I don't want to put words in like this. I then took it to kind of when I use her work with clients, I say, well, let's strategize. Let's do some activity scheduling for you and your partner. Let's figure out what would be the most romantic thing for you. Do you need to have a full day sleep before you have the baby to have sex even one time? How do we have that happen for you? How can you do a babysitting swap? I mean, and obviously it depends on what the level of mental wellness is right. that can even happen. Sure. But then it's like, well, what kinds of then gentle, intimate touches that you can do that maybe are not more genital focused, but fall in that category of increasing that connection. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this sounds like a great entry point into kind of talking about how to resolve some of these issues and how to bring a couple back together. And you're breaking it down into very small manageable steps that are, you know, I'm thinking of, like you said, the lady who's like, no way, we're not doing this at all, is kind of finding out what's going to work for her by just exploring. Yeah, what's exploring? And then I like to look at it this way. You know, most people when they first have sex have no idea what they're doing, right? If you think back to your own first sexual encounter, you both had no idea what you were doing and you had no idea how your body worked. Right. So this is where we start to talk a little bit more about the sexuality, Mm -hmm. which is that a lot of clients are not able to articulate that positive adult sexuality. Maybe it's sort of like, They don't know their body anymore because obviously what a body is like before pregnancy is just not going to be the same after. Mm -hmm. And that's not to scare anybody who's listening who has not yet had a child. It's just to say that, you know, you literally have the cells from your baby now in your brain. So you are like kind of only a completely new person Mm -hmm. and you have to get to know that new person. Yeah. And I think when we come into our sexuality as young people, there's so much this like, oh, acceptance that maybe one encounter was sort of fumbling or bad, Mm -hmm. but that didn't really deter us from doing it again. Mm -hmm. Right. Or we didn't kind of know and we made a mess of it, meaning like we didn't satisfy our partners, we didn't satisfy ourselves, but that again did not stop us from doing it again. Mm -hmm. So it's about what do you find now that might actually work for you? And it's different ways of touching. What worked for you touch-wise before may not work for you touch-wise now. Mm -hmm. Different kinds of genital play might have been useful before, but not good now. 
your, you know, interior, there might be more sensitivity on one part of your vaginal wall than there was before. Like these things are real. Mm -hmm. We know that breastfeeding moms have a lot of issues with lubrication that is hormonally related. So, you know, even just getting up the nerve to go online and buy some water-based lube or going into the store to do that or making that part of a date and going to a sex shop. Like, you know, all those things seem so like, oh God, no way when you're literally breastfeeding an infant at eight weeks. Mm -hmm. But these are sort of the steps that you take. Right. And I appreciate you breaking that down because I mean, I think anyways, for the moms who I'm meeting with and who are coming and having a hard time, just trying to keep their head above water, like this is often the last thing on their mind or it's on their mind and they're kind of like, oh, I don't want to think about it or I don't want to, you know, it seems overwhelming to even the thought of getting back into any kind of intimacy. And I would say to that, do something small then. Sit down with your partner or even by yourself and write down what were like your five best sex moments before you had a baby. Like what were the ones that were so completely amazing that you actually remember what that orgasm was like or what that encounter or intimacy or what made that moment special, right? And so when you write down those five moments, it's like you do write down what was so special about that. I felt very close to my partner. We were in this amazing setting. We were laughing and giggling. You know, we had just done whatever it was. And then you kind of think about, well, what would I need to get back to that point to recreate, not recreate, because obviously moments are moments in the past, but how to get some of that back. Right. And I think this is what happens is that couples are like literally waiting for the other person to make the move. Mm -hmm. They're like, I don't want to have sex. You have to make me have sex. And, you know, usually the partner who's been reaching out and getting rejected after a while just gives up. Mm Mm-hmm. Right. And then it's like, but that builds up resentment because if you're constantly being rejected, if your need is not just physical, you know, for cis couples, if you're a man and you're really reaching out to your partner because you want that affection and that closeness and that connection and a reminder of why you even had a baby in the first place and you're constantly being rejected, that's not going to lend itself to like actually doing, you know, turning towards your partner anyway. Mm -hmm. There's all those bids for affection. So even if you're on a couch and you're overwhelmed and you can't think of doing anything, like, can you notice your partner's bid for affection? And if you say, I'm not able to meet it sexually with, you know, a sexual dynamic, how can I meet it with intimacy or touching or like, you know, and if you really can't do anything, if it's like, I really have nothing left to give my partner. I mean, that's the point where something needs to be a bigger conversation. Mm -hmm. And as you were talking about this, I was thinking that all of this stuff you're describing, the bids for attention and the rejection, that's often not explicitly discussed. It could be that he's sort of trying to reach out physically and she just like turns her back or something like that, that these dynamics that you're discussing, there's not necessarily an open dialogue between the couple, that they're both understanding this from each other. Mm -hmm. It just is that you know, he's trying, he feels rejected, she's irritated, she's like shuts it down. And then the resentment goes from there. And the resentment then means he withdraws and pulls away Mm -hmm. and doesn't necessarily, again, contribute to the support. You know, if we're talking about moms who feel like they're carrying a lot of the mental load, you know, he's withdrawing because he's constantly feeling like, well, nothing I'm doing is good enough. Right. Mm -hmm. And We know new moms feel that way about baby, but they're not looking at their relationship. They're just like, I just can't. But then you've got two people in opposite corners waiting for the other person to change without being willing to do any of that change for themselves. So how can you listen for those bids for affection? How can you at least give like a peace offering? What might that look like for you? You know, sure, it's not necessarily going to be something big, but you know, if you're like, there's no way I want to be touched well, you know, offer something small. Mm-hmm. Like if you can't deal with a hand job, <laughs> give a back rub. I know it sounds so like crass and straightforward, but for real. And similarly, if you need, if you're like, you know what would really get me sexed up right now and turned on? If you cleaned the entire kitchen and did all the laundry, I will be on the bed waiting for you when those things are done. Right. Right? It's like, I, yes, I've say had that. that conversation. 
yes, I'm so glad that you're putting it out there blankly for people to just say that. Because I don't think that the mom that is like, you know, overwhelmed by how she's feeling is she's maybe thinking more like, I mean, so tired. I don't want to do anything, but it hasn't gotten into the point of like, well, yeah, if you did the dishes and did the laundry, I'm all over this. So I really appreciate you being really, really distinct and clear about supporting people to say specifically these things. And that very clear dialogue is what makes for good sex anyway, Mm -hmm. right? Because when you remember if you're a young adult and you're moving towards sexuality and you finally do figure out, oh my gosh, here are the magic places to touch on my body that lead to like fulfillment in some way. Generally in good sexuality, we are able to communicate that to our partner like, oh, move a little bit left, move a little bit right. Oh, you know what? Can you be a little more firm? I don't like feather touch. All of that good dialogue about how to have sexual satisfaction, it's no different in this precursor to actual sex. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the key to adult female sexuality, right? That we are very like earthy and grounded And we're not this like manic pixie girl, right? (laughs) Like that concept from like almost famous or made famous by Garden State, right? Which is what I think a lot of women of childbearing age grew up with. Those are very, I want to just acknowledge those are very white examples. But I think that's kind of this concept of like this girl who's just sort of like carefree, but intelligent, but like caters to the dude. Uh. You know, I mean, I think that's a very young sexuality. Yeah. And we don't have a lot of great role models for like very sexy that are not vampy. Right. You know, I mean, we've got these like vampy sort of role models, but in this popular culture, but it's like really what adult female sexuality looks like is knowing what turns you on and being able to articulate it. And it sounds so easy when I say it, but it's so hard to do if culturally or religion or feeling uncomfortable because of whatever the stuff is going on with baby. Like, I think that's really hard for women to do. Right. Yeah. No, that's absolutely true. I'm so glad, you know, to hear you say that we don't have a good representation. I mean, even in you talking about it, I'm realizing you're right. Like, of course, no, we don't. It's this really sort of adolescent thing. Or all these, you know, like, I don't know if you want to say like the cougars and right. whatnot, like there's no realistic representation yeah, of what, no, like, I mean, it's like, sure, you know, I mean, it's like, I'm trying to think of cougar, right? So that's like, um, the sex in the city chick, what the, she kind of like made that very famous or I mm-hmm. don't know, but it's a little creepy. It's like, yeah. I think that representation of it is creepy. And, you know, in this sort of, it's diminishing of an adult woman's sexuality. It fetishizes it yeah, in a way that I don't think. So it's like, if these are your options, you're either this like manic pixie girl who's like carefree Mm -hmm. or you're this cougar on the prowl. I mean, there's a lot more in the spectrum of adult female sexuality than those two things, ladies. I promise you. (laughs) And, and, you know, and I think this is the same for dads, right? Mm Mm-hmm. There is like dad sexuality is also reduced to these really awful stereotypes. Mm -hmm. And it's like the goofy dad. It's Mm -hmm. like, you know, dad jokes and Mm -hmm. white sneakers. And, (laughs) you know, maybe now he carries the baby around in the Bjorn, but like there's no, you know, he doesn't know how to use the bottle. He's like totally incompetent. Incompetent Mm -hmm. dad is like, and then he's lusting after the young girls. Like there's also a lot more adult role like yeah and is sort of shown and I will say because we know men's testosterone drops in the postpartum period you know sometimes their libido drops and I have to say I know we haven't really talked a lot about this but I have to say I oftentimes do get moms in my office who are like I am really horny I don't want my boobs touched but I really want to get off and my husband won't Mm -hmm. you know men have erectile dysfunction Right. I mean, it's just sort of like as their testosterone is dropping and they're also nervous and anxious and will the kids hear and will they walk in and Mm -hmm. this is so important because I never get to touch her and like, what if I mess it up? And, you know, there's all of this stuff too for men. Yeah. Thank you for speaking to that. And it sounds like there's more to say. (laughs) Always. Can you speak more to that? About this kind of like our common ideas or that women don't want sex and men do and 
that's not true all the time. It's not true all the time. I mean, statistically, gosh, I'm trying to think it's like, I am not going to be able to pull the percentages up right now in my brain, but let's see. How do I say this? I think that so often there's an assumption that it is moms who don't want sex postpartum. And I don't know that that's, you know, it's, it's not the case all the time. I think that sometimes women do have kind of a new found appreciation for their bodies. And depending on what their birth experience was like, it can be incredibly empowering. Like, holy shit, I did that. Right. What else can this body do? Let me take it out like, and you know, <laughs> see the world with it, kind of. Right, right. And depending on, you know, partners are not immune from the same kind of traumas that women are. Mm -hmm. If you have a mom who maybe had, you know, maybe there was bleeding or there was a moment in the birthing experience, you know, we know trauma is so relative. So maybe mom had no sense that there was any trauma going on. But dad got so worried, mm -hmm. right? Because childbirth is so mysterious. And, you know, when you don't know and you're not in the body and you're seeing someone go through this and being in pain, yeah. you know, plenty of times men have trauma for different reasons, right? And, of mm -hmm. course, whatever their own history was, have they had sexual violation themselves? I think that is something that is not talked about mm -hmm. very often at all is right. that, you know, in almost equal numbers, but really underreported men get, you know, molested similarly to women. And right. that trauma comes up too when there's a new baby. Right. For dads too. So dads are also dealing with their ghosts and their nurseries. So I'm not suggesting that it's just dads who have sexual victimization that don't want mm -hmm. sex. I mean, it's very multi-layered, yeah. but, but I think it's just something we don't think about too. And I think it's that like worry and concern too about baby. Mm -hmm. you know, I see a lot of difficulty when that testosterone drops, right? And we know that it's about four to six months postpartum is when men's testosterone drops the most. And that's actually one of the things I can't wait to see if we're all right or wrong when um, Darby uh, Saxby kind of, you know, finishes her study mm -hmm. where they're, they're doing both the hormonal and the MRIs to kind of see what's going on. But that's kind of the current theory right now. And so if there's not a lot of testosterone, there may not be easy access to sex. And also it's about that rejection too and pressure. Mm -hmm. If mom is like, you can have sex with me between 10 a.m. and 12 a.m. on Saturday when the baby is sleeping, mm -hmm. it's like, oh my God, okay, that's the only time. Right. That's so much pressure. Mm -hmm. Right. That's understandable. Sounds like we could and maybe should have a whole other <laughs> episode, you know, on this specifically, but dads too. But just, um, in, and I mean, I, again, because sex is such a complicated topic and does mm -hmm. inform the rest of the marital satisfaction. You know, there was a study on dads in Jamaica, and I'll just kind of wrap up with this, but it was a really big study. It was over 3,000 new dads. And, you know, the biggest predictor of marital satisfaction for men was their sexual satisfaction. Of course, there's a little bit of cultural differences, I think, just in terms of sexuality and partnering. And we have to take that into account with any of these studies outside of the U.S. But I don't think that that's not true here. I would say that I think for so many reasons that we're talking about that men of childbearing age really do often haven't been taught the language mm -hmm. of expression of caring and yeah. connection. Yeah. I mean, it's rampant. It affects so many things, let alone, you know, just right here in the postpartum, all the, I don't know, I'm hoping like the next generations that are kind of raised in this more kind of, it's okay to talk about your feelings kind of culture. Maybe they won't have to deal with this as much, but also you know, the dads that are coming up now didn't have role models to be the kinds of dads that they are now, even it's like more involved. Father. Well, that's right. I mean, they might have had dads who had did some laundry or some dishes, but they weren't taking on the full mental load. Because mm -hmm. we know for moms, right, they get so exhausted because even if they're like dads are doing the grocery shopping and we know, right, marketers are, are really focusing on mm -hmm. dads now because dads are doing more and more of the grocery shopping, but it's like mom is sending him to the grocery store with the list. She's still taking on that mental load. Mm -hmm. So one of the ways that I work around this with couples is that I kind of say, okay, let's sit down and talk about what has to get done. What do you like doing? 
what do you absolutely not like doing? And how can we kind of take a little bit from each of those absolutely not like doing and take one or two of them? And then I find that sometimes when that happens, particularly for women, it eases up that like anger and resentment Mm -hmm. that so often gets stuck in that loop. And then they can be more generous or respond more to their partner's bids for attention. And then again, that leads more towards turning towards each other Mm -hmm. and kind of like standing in opposite quarters, waiting for the other person to change. Right. Fantastic. Well, I thank you so much for bringing all of this to light. And I know there's so much more that we could talk about, but I feel like this is a great foundation for discussion about sex and sexuality in the postpartum period. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me, Kat. I'm so excited to have had the chance to talk about it. And I just want to also say congratulations to you because I know you've done this podcast now for what I think it's like nearly a hundred episodes. And I just want to say it's so important the work you're doing and thank you. Thank you so much. I'm so glad we were able to have this discussion today. It comes up a lot. A lot of people have questions about this. And I think it's so important for us to open this up to even just to think about, even if you're not going to be having a conversation about your partner, but really to be thinking about for yourself, how are you doing and how do you want to be interacting and what are your needs? Sex and sexuality are a really important part of our own humanity and our own process and the way we stay connected to our partners. So if you'd like to learn more about Elise, go to elisespringer.com. You can connect with her on Twitter at eSpringerMFT or Facebook, Elise Springer Marriage and Family Therapist. And as usual, we'd love to have you connect with us here at the Mom and Mind podcast, either on the web. You can download and subscribe to our many, many episodes. Connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, or at our Mom and Mind Connection Facebook group. Thanks so much for being here. Until next time. By joining us today, you are part of the growing community of people who are aware and concerned for mothers and families during this beautiful and sometimes very difficult time of life. If you or someone you know is having a hard time, help is available. You can feel better. Please look for resources for help at momandmind.com. Together, we can support moms and families so that no one has to deal with this alone. Thank you for listening and being a part of the Mom and Mind community.